Why on earth are there so many Bibles, and what is the best one to use? Well, let's look and answer that question. Why are there so many Bibles? Well, there are different answers for that. One is just, just a marketing. People want to sell books, and bookstores want to sell Bibles because Bibles are always the Bible is always the number one selling book every year that I know of, anyway. And so people want to sell and make money. That's that's one just real practical reason as to why there are so many different Bibles. Uh, but why are there different translations, and what are the differences, and and which one should you use? We first need to be aware, though, of three major translation theories for what Bibles take. So if you look at different Bibles, they will, generally speaking, uh, fall into one of roughly three or four translational theories. And there is a spectrum, as we're going to look at. One theory is the essentially literal or formal equivalent translational style or theory. And that means that the authors tried or the translators tried to be as literal as possible with the text without adding as much interpretation as possible. Now, all translation is going to have a little bit of interpretation. That's unavoidable. But those who hold to an essentially literal translation want to minimize that. Sometimes this is considered a word-for-word translation, but that's not really possible because, for example, in Greek, you would get, you would get, you don't, you don't have every word translated. For example, typically nouns have the, the article, the definite article in front of it, like the Peter. So you would get things like the Peter said to the Jesus. And that's, that's simple little or don't, doesn't do that. So it's not a word-for-word translation but it does try to be as literal as possible. So that's the essentially literal or formal equivalent type translation. Then you've got dynamic equivalent or functional equivalent translation. And those are okay with being a little bit freer in the translation because they think that there's, there's words and ways of talking that don't make sense if you try to be as literal as possible. We're going to look at some of that. And then you've got paraphrases. Paraphrases would, would, would not really be a translation. You're trying to get the, the general uh, notion. So as, as a dynamic, is, it's kind of a thought for thought. The paraphrase is more of just even just a general gist of what the original authors tried to say or, or actually or said. Okay. So here's a, a chart that shows a, a spectrum of translations, and this is from a book called Translating Truth, the Case for Essentially Literal Bible Translation. So if you're interested in this topic, that's a good book to get. But here's a chart that gives just some of some of the uh, more popular English translations. So you can see you've got the, the King James, the New King James, the Revised Standard, New American Standard, ESV. The New Revised Standard, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, now it's called the Christian Standard Bible, and the Net Bible, the New English Translation. Those are all going to be in your essentially literal category. Okay? Then you got a mixed, which is not really essentially literal. It's not quite dynamic equivalent either. That'll be your, your translation like, like your NIV, your NIVI, your TNIV, your today's New English version. Then you get more into the dynamic equivalent, which is Good News Bible your revised English Bible. Uh, I can't even keep up with all these translations. The New Century Version, uh, the Contemporary English Version. Then you've got more paraphrastic uh, or just it's kind of, those kind of Bibles that are very loose. That's going to be the Living Bible, the Message. And then you've got really just all downright silly translations like, for example, the Cotton Patch Bible. The Cotton Patch Bible is written for Southerners <laughs> In the southern dialect, it has Jesus being born in Gainesville, Georgia, and, and instead of retreating to Egypt, he retreats to Mexico, and um, you know stuff like that. It's just it's written, I guess, supposed to be. I don't know whether people is, they think that that people it would make more sense to people in the south or what. I'm from the south, and this I don't think anybody I've ever met uh, in the south. I've been my, my whole life in the south and uh, southeast and. Uh, I've never met anybody who had that Bible, but it's there 
the Cotton Patch Bible. I don't think people really needed to understand the text. I'm not sure if that was supposed to be just for funsies or what. I don't know, but but you got the Cotton Patch Bible. So that's kind of a spectrum of translation. All right. Now I'm going to argue that for for Bible study and actually even just for reading, I personally think that it's better to have an essentially literal Bible translation. So personally, I like. Um, I, I typically read the, the ESV, I like the, the New King James, New American Standard, a lot of people like the King James. Um, I think those are the best because they are going to try the best to be as literal as possible with the, with the, with the uh, least amount of interpretation uh, on behalf of the, of the translators. And the doctrine of inerrancy really plays a part in this because if every word, inerrancy just means that that every that the Bible is inspired, and if the Bible is completely inspired in a plenary or a full sense, then there are no orig- there are no errors in the originals. Doesn't mean there aren't errors in the copies, because we do have errors both intentional and changes intentionally, not, not an intentional error, but intentional change, like a place name might be updated. Uh, but uh, if, if every word is inspired, then it would put more of an onus or desire on the interpreter or translator to take account of every single word and try to translate it exactly as the text was meant to be understood in the original language. Of course, that's Hebrew for the most part for the Old Testament, a little bit of Aramaic, especially in Daniel, uh, and then Greek in the New Testament. Now, these Bible translations do have a little bit different text that underlie it. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the, at the opening of your Bible, you will see that there is, I have, this is the, the English Standard Version up here, and if you open up the, the beginning of the Bible, it's called the front matter, uh, it'll talk to you about the translation philosophy. So if you don't know, well, what version do I have? What, what translation philosophy does it have or use? Uh, you can see here that the ESV is an essentially literal translation. It says that it seeks to, as far as possible to reproduce the precise wording of the original text uh, and the personal style of each Bible writer. Um, as such, the emphasis is on word for word, uh, although that really is a little bit misleading because just the word order in Greek is different than, say, in English. Um, a lot of the times where it can be. Uh, translational principles uh, and style. And then uh, translation of special terms, and how does the Bible translate certain words, especially the Old Testament like Yahweh, um, and then the textual basis. So there are differences in our Bibles between the, the underlying Greek, especially the Greek, more than Hebrew, uh, that it, it relies on. So again, if you look at this, it says the ESV is based on the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible. And then the, the Greek, it, it says, is based on the uh, New Testament, is based on the fifth edition published by the UBS uh, and the Novum Testamentum Graeca of the 28th edition. Okay, so what that means, the, the UBS or the Nestle Elan text is called a critical text. It has more. It draws more from various kinds of manuscripts. Okay, there are a little over five thousand manuscripts, and one manuscript could be just the size of a, of a credit card, or it could be the entire New Testament. Uh, and there are th- basically three uh, families of text types. So, if you take any Greek manuscript, it will generally speaking fall into one of three types. Uh, or families. There are there's some debate about whether there's a fourth or or more, but um, it's it's generally accepted that there are at least three schools or families of of the kinds of Greek text. One is the Alexandrian text, which there there was found more around Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, one is the the Western text, which is has more more found in in Western Europe, and then we have the the uh, Byzantine text, which those are found primarily in Byzantium or now Turkey. And the, the majority, the overwhelming majority of English Bibles use the Alexandrian or the eclectic text. 
the King James and the New King James use the Byzantine. Some people prefer the King James or the New King James, and some people like that fact that it's based on that family of text type. Um, and those who are considered King James only or only read the King James may like that. Uh, and there's a lot of debate among Greek scholars as to whether or not the Alexandrian text type is better or the, the Byzantine text. The Byzantine text is called the majority text because the, the overwhelming majority of, of the New Testament manuscripts in Greek are Byzantine in character, even though they're later, they're more found around the 10th century or so, as opposed to are some earlier ones that the Alexandrian ones have in that family. There's a lot, a lot of debate about that. I might have another video on that topic. That's a whole other thing I don't want to get into much right now. Um, but there, there's a lot of debate about which style or which family is, is more likely to be the original and if you're interested in what your Bible uses and look at the front matter, it will tell you if it says UBS or United Bible Societies or the Novum Testamentum Greca or the, um, the Nestle and Elan text, that's the Alexandrian or critical text. And most English translations use that. I do want to point out, though, that there's not that much of a difference between those families. I don't want that to be an, a, a, a sore spot of, well, is there a huge difference in those in those text types? There, there is a difference, but it's not. It's probably not more than about ten percent. Uh, it's not a big number anyway, and most of those are are, are very minor uh, in nature. So one big difference is that the adulterous woman passage from John seven fifty three through eight eleven is not in the Alexandrian text. So if you have uh, a Bible that says the earliest and quote unquote best manuscripts don't contain these verses, whether that's in John or, or where or somewhere else. Uh, that's referring to the Alexandrian text. So which is, is better? We'll look at that maybe in a different video. Um, there are uh, arguments that people use on on both of those. Um, it to me, it's it's good to be aware of that, but there's it's not going to change the overall theology. There's no doctrine that's endangered by going with one text over another. You just might have some passages that are a little bit different uh, in the, in a given in a given passage, but it's not going to change any overall overall theology. You don't lose anything, for example, if you don't have the adulterous one passage. I'm not saying it should be in there. I think there's good arguments for the Byzantine text type. Uh, Maurice Robinson has some really interesting arguments for that. If you want to look up his work in his Greek New Testament. Uh, according to the Byzantine, he has an article in the back of that uh, that you can look if you're interested in that kind of argument. It's really interesting. So we've got essentially literal Bibles. You've got dynamic equivalent Bibles. You've got paraphrases. Again, if the role if the role of inerrancy is such that if every word is inspired, then every word is important. Uh, now, there are some words that are left out in certain dynamic equivalent versions. All right. And there are just some differences in how things are translated. So let's look real quick at here's a, a text comparison. I've got the ESV, the New King James, the NIV, the New Living Translation, and this is the message on the right. Look at how the English Standard Version, the New English, the English Standard Version, the ESV, translates 1 Kings 2:10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Now, that's an essentially literal translation, and those who argue more for a dynamic interpretation or translation say that people aren't going to know what slept means. So we're going to say, as, as the NLT does, that David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Okay. Um, I'm using Logos if you're interested in the software here. This is Logos Bible software. You can pick which Bibles you want to include uh, in all these um, differences. So they got, you can also change what, what you see and don't see. Uh, so I've, right now I have the ESV as the base text, and I have all these other ones here. Uh, you've got, you can, it'll tell the, the percentage of differences between this translation and the base text. I can change what the base text is. Um, it'll tell me what words are, are not there. If I cross out, that will tell me the words that are not there. Um, words that are in blue are different, and you can see that. Um, but Logos is a great software program. I'll probably have some more stuff on Logos. 
But the, the those who argue for an essentially literal translation make a couple of arguments here. One is that, well, it is pretty obvious what slept means, especially since you have the word buried here. Um, and we have other uses in the Bible. In the New Testament, that, that talks about sleeping as a metaphor for dying. And those who hold to a, a, a more literal, essentially literal translational philosophy argue that if you just say die, you're losing some of the rich metaphorical language that you get with the word slept, because slept or sleep, or even as the New King James says, rested, uh, has the idea of, of there's something else. It's not, it's not final. What died doesn't capture the notion that, well, if you're asleep, you could get up again. You could rise again. If you're rested, you could get up again. But if you're dead, and he was dead. It doesn't mean he was dead. Uh, but it loses that, that kind of uh, rich metaphorical language. Let's look at another passage, 1 Timothy 3.11. This is a controversial passage in and of itself. It's talking about the qualifications of deacons. And we can see here that the ESV, again, my base text says, look back, let's look back at verse, uh, verse 8. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified. Nine, they must hold the mystery of the faith with their conscience. Ten, uh, let them also be test, tested first. Verse 11, I'm skipping some here. Um, their wives. So that translation makes you think that the deacons' wives must have certain qualifications or characteristics. But let's look at the NIV. It says, in the same way, the women are to be worthy. What does that mean, women deacons or just women in general? Well, this is a debate. This is a big debate among uh, scholars and theologians as to whether or not women can be deacons. The NLT, in the same way, their wives must be respected, the message. No exceptions are to be made for women. Same qualifications, serious, dependable, not sharp tongue. You can see the difference there. Got a 74% difference from the message back to the ESV. A 32% difference from the New King James. Again, a big one with the NIV, 73%. But you can see here that there, there is a huge difference between uh, the translational theory and what they say and how they, how they translate. So. It's not clear. Let's look at, uh, at the New English Version. I'm going to turn it over just to that Bible here in Logos. And I've got this, uh, this button here that turned on the original languages. Boom. There we go. A little magic there. Let's look at verse 11 here. It says, Their wives likewise must be dignified. The dot under these words here means that the word is not in the original Greek and has been supplied there in English. Now, sometimes that just is required because. Um, Sometimes there is one word in Greek that can have uh, a subject and a verbal aspect to it. In this case, this is a pronoun. The word there is a pronoun, modifying the word wives. And uh, it's not there in Greek, and some people argue that it shouldn't be there in English either. And sometimes the word in English that's not there in Greek or Hebrew will be italicized to indicate that it's not in the original. Let's see real quick. I can just push my right button and go to the New American Standard. So if you look here at New American Standard, uh, you see these words that are italicized. That means they're not in the original Greek. So I've got a little note here with number one. It says either deacons, wives, or deaconesses. So my point here is compare text, compare translations, because even translations that are uh, in the same translational theory can have differences there. So again, the ESV and the New American Standard differs uh, between, for example, when it says in Matthew 5, 18, it says in the New American Standard, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Uh, the ESV says not an iota, not a dot will pass away. Well, that's different from the smallest letter or stroke. Uh, in this instance, the ESV is more accurate, even though a lot of times the New American Standard is a little bit more literal. The ESV here is, is simply more accurate. Um, so, and that's one way that the that the dynamic equivalent translators like to translate because they think, well, people aren't going to know what an iota or a dot is. Those are some of the smallest marks in Hebrew. So even the New American Standard. Who, that that uh, normally is very literal, uh, chose to be a little bit more dynamic there. 
So there's a little bit of fluidity in these in these theories, and 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 a little bit of a uh, a spectrum, as our our book we looked at a while ago shows. Now there are some words that are left out in the dynamic equivalent version. So let's look at Romans 13. I'll look at verse three and four. And look at some of the differences between the ESV and especially the New Living Translation. Here we go with these two different uh, philosophies. The ESV says, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Let's look at the New Living Translation here in verse 4, Romans 13, 4. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. No mention of a sword. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who who do what is wrong. No mention of wrath. Okay, why is that a big deal? Well, because one, the author thought it was important to use the word sword and to use the word wrath. Now, in some contexts, there may be a specific theological reason why an author put a word there. For example, wrath is oftentimes argued uh, theologically as a distinction from just general judgment. So, for example, in Revelation, wrath is only applied to non-believers. It's not applied to believers or the church, which is one reason why people argue for the rapture, because there is not any wrath poured out on, on the church there. So there is a theological distinction there between wrath and just judgment. So how do you know whether it's important or not for these words to be in there? Well, one is just to respect the, the inspiration of the text and try to take account of every word that is there. Uh, And if we just start leaving words out in our translations, then we don't know. You might miss, if you're reading the New Living Translation, it may be the case that Paul or whatever, some writer that you're reading says something to allude to something else, but if he leaves a word out in that translation, you might miss the allusion there. Not illusion, the allusion, the the, the reference, reference back to another another place to take your your uh, your attention to something else that he wants to make a connection, which you can't make a connection if the words are missing. So we have words left out in the dynamic translation in some cases. Let's look at another example of that. It was John 12. Look at John 12 and verse 27. The ESV, this is Jesus speaking, now, my, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Let me make it the NLT again. And I'm picking on the NLT because this is what the, the book, uh, the uh, Translating Truth book uses these examples, so it was an easy one for me to, to pick on. The NLT says, now my soul is deeply troubled. Uh, should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? Now, while the ESV adds the word soul, in this case, the NLT has it as well, some versions like the New Contemporary Version or the Contemporary English Version or the Message, as you can see here, leave that word out. So there, again, there might be a reason why that is in there. Now, there also are some words added by dynamic translations. So let's look at 1 Timothy 5.22. So, for example, the ESV says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. The New King James says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. The NIV says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. The New Living Translation says, Never be in a hurry about appointing a church leader. There's nothing in the Greek about a church leader or an elder. That is simply added in there. The message says the same thing. Don't appoint people to church leadership positions too hastily. The text does not say that. Even if that is the underlying meaning of the passage and is talking about leadership, that's simply not the exact wording of the Greek text. So we need to be careful not to add words 
Let's look at James 3, 2, ESV. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. The, the message says something very different. And none of us is perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. The text doesn't say that. So this is just this is a little bit too free here. Uh, again, there are there are variations in a spectrum of these different translations, but in my opinion, it is safer to stick with a translation that is more literal and and doesn't leave out words as much as the dynamic ones do, and doesn't add words like the the uh, dynamic ones do. Uh, so I argue that, that based on inerrancy and trying to take account for every word and not to change the text uh, as much as possible, I would argue that a, uh, an essentially literal translation, the ESV, the New King James Version, the New American Standard, the Christian Standard, those are, those are good translations. The NIV, again, is kind of a halfway between the essentially literal and more dynamic equivalent uh, translation. Then there are all kinds of study Bibles out there. I'm not going to go into all the different types, but there are all kinds of uh, study Bibles. One problem people have is that they they want to learn about the Bible in the original language, but they don't have the knowledge uh, of the original language to be able to do that. There are some pretty interesting toys out there <laughs> to, to help you do that, and I'll go. I have I'll have more videos on that in the future. Here's a Bible. It's called the New English Translation or the Net Bible, and it has, as you can you can see if you're watching the video, has over sixty thousand nine hundred and thirty two translational notes. It actually is a second edition. This is the first edition. But let me just show you. So everything, if you're, again, watching the video, and if you're just listening to the podcast, go check out the video on YouTube. Um, some videos lend themselves, or some talks, podcasts, lend themselves better to a video. But if you can't only listen to it, that's good, too. But you see kind of this line here. Everything under this line is a, is a note. Almost everything uh, on that page is a, is a note. And there are different kinds of notes. There, for example, is the, uh, the TN, which is a textual or our translator's note. There are uh, the TC is a, a text critical kind of note, and what this Bible does is it goes more into detail about, um, for example, uh, the original languages. For example, here's Romans five one. There's a variant here. There's a variation between the uh, the uh, Greek manuscripts. Uh, so for for example, it says Romans five one. Therefore, since we have since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God. A little note there, number four, and if you scroll all the way down to number four, I can get it there. It'll have all this discussion of the textual uh, commentary and why there is a, a variant there or what the variant is. Uh, and I can, we can go into more detail in a future video on how to play with these, these fun little toys. But the Net Bible is, is fun because it gives you a lot of notes, not just on textual issues, but on translators' decisions. So the Net Bible really is more of a dynamic equivalent. So I don't really like the translation, um, but the notes in it are really interesting and um, uh, uh, good for you if you're looking for uh, commentary and, and more of uh, notes on the original languages and translational uh, type decisions. Let me go over one other kind of Bible for you that, that is um, really useful. And that is going to, there are two different kinds here. One is an interlinear. Okay, so the interlinear will start off with the base text, that is the main text, being the original language. So, for example, this is Greek. This is uh, John 1. So, you can, you can see here that the base text is, is Greek. Now, this isn't the best example because the the, the English wording pretty closely follows the Greek. But in the interlinear, you got the original language as the Greek text, and then you have the English under it that tries to capture the, the basic gist of that Greek word. Uh, you can see in the English here, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word. In the English, that's different. Uh, and you'll see these, these differences here uh, with the numbering and that kind of thing. And in, in a reverse interlinear, You've got the English being the base text. Okay. Again, in the beginning was the word, that's the English. And you have uh, these little note, these little numbers here. Let me make this a little bit bigger. These numbers here 
indicate the order of the Greek words. So that's the first word, that's the second word. And again, this is not a, the best example because they're almost in the same order. Um, it's not until you get later in the, the this verse where you start seeing a difference in order. Uh, but this is a reverse interlinear. If you have logos, then you, you should be able to have some of these um, reverse interlinears with, I know the the ESV, I think the NIV and NASB and KJV, those kind of things. So it's just interesting there to see what the Greek words actually are if you're wanting to do more of a, of a Bible study. But this has just been a, a, a brief overview as to what are some of the different kinds of Bible translations and what might be good for you to use. As long as you're reading the Bible, that's good. Um, again, I'm arguing for more of an essentially literal translation um, to be able to, to honor the doctrine of inspiration and inerrancy and not have to worry about if your if your translators have left words out or added words in. So I hope this was valuable for you. Uh, please leave me a comment or a question if you like. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.